has spoken here numerous times. Um, he, everybody enjoys having him here because he gets us thinking. Um, there's so much going on that he wants to share, so I don't want to take any more of the time. So let's give a big welcome to Brad Peterson. Tell you that uh, doing these polyrad sessions is one of the most enjoyable things I get to do in my whole life. And I appreciate all of you taking an interest in this class. I suppose there are many reasons why people take the class. Some of you probably just heard it was a blast and it's fun and it's an easy credit, you know. I suppose that's okay, but I hope you learned something in the process. Uh, I hope there are a lot of you that really took it for what I would consider the right reason because you understand that politics and the science of human government has a direct effect on all of our lives. And for too long, the majority of Americans have sat back and just let it all happen. Uh, your nation's perishing this morning. Your future is beyond ominous. America is like a car with a blown engine perched on the edge of a cliff, and Obama and the God-hating communist left are about to push your future off of the cliff into the pit of hell. And I'm not playing with words. I'm not kidding at all this morning. And I'll just tell you, this will be probably one of the last polygraph sessions I get to do, and I have life-threatening health conditions, so please take me seriously this morning. And I don't want pity, I just want your attention. Just take that for what it's worth. I do this because I love it. It's not a paid position. I need to be working and paying bills like everybody else out there to support this monstrosity of stinking government that Obama has expanded beyond all boundaries. And the nation is now $16 trillion in debt. There's no end in sight. And I'm going to tell you this morning right off the bat, if we elect that communist idiot again next time, you don't have a future, none of you, unless you're going to go work for the stinking beast itself and get employed by some stinking state or federal government position and draw all the benefits and all the pensions. But I promise you, it's not going to last, because we're done for. We're done for. But I'm not here just to tear up Obama this morning. He happens to be the latest of many jerks and reprobates and anti-capitalist idiots that have occupied the White House. He is, though, the worst. He's worse than Jimmy Carter, and that's saying a mouthful. He's far worse than even Jimmy Carter. I consider Jimmy Carter a traitor to the United States. Obama's beyond. But how do we get these kind of leaders? How do we get people that hate the Constitution, despise the wisdom of the Founding Fathers, are anti-Christ in their spiritual mentality, are pro-Islamic, are pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel, pro-world government, anti-capitalist, anti-the working class, how do we get people like this? Well, it's our own damnable stupidity as we go to the polls and don't know our right hand from our left. And I want to talk to you a bit this morning about the history and legacy of the left versus the right. This is not kid stuff. You're going to have to grow up real fast when you leave the comforts of home because that world out there is burning down. The job market is disappearing. And I'll tell you this, as high school seniors, I'll tell you this. Before you strap on $40,000 worth of debt on student loans so you can go to college and party your brains out and maybe get an education, maybe not just have fun for the next four years, before you do that, you better understand that we had the dot-com bubble and we had the housing bubble and the banking bubble. And the latest bubble that's going to burst is the student loan bubble. You know why? Because the jobs are gone and nobody can pay them back. So don't strap yourself on with a massive amount of debt and think you're going to walk out there into a job market and just skip into a high salary job, an entry level position. Are you kidding me? If you're going to do that, though, if you're going to college and you're set on it, you better think hard about what you go into. I think you'd be better off to walk right into a family business. If you've got an opportunity to do that, and get your feet on the ground, learn some responsibility, learn some principles, and how to run something. And by the way, this president has never run anything but his stupid mouth. His communist, left-wing, socialist, European, Bill Ayers, communist mouth. That's all he's ever run. And he is 
the most unqualified child president this country has ever been stupid enough to elect. But if you could walk into a small business that's in your family already or in a friend or a relative of the family, I would do it. And I would stand by for a while and watch what's going to happen to this economy. Because every economist that's being honest today is telling us that the American dream is over with. The prosperity of your parents and grandparents is over with. And this president and some before him, and this Congress and some before them, have spent us into a pit of financial ruin. And it's just not there anymore. So be careful before you strap on a bunch of student loan debt. I want to tell you today to get yourself a set of core principles and determine now what you're going to use as your standard for right and wrong as you go out into the college world or the workplace. Before you leave the comforts of home and the guidance of your parents and having all your bills paid, and I'm not saying some of you don't work. I worked construction my senior year of high school and paid my bills, and my dad made me buy half of my first motorcycle and all of my vehicles from then on. Listen, man, don't do it unless, unless you're going to be top of the class, cream of the crop, best of the best. If you're making C's and D's in high schools and think you're going to college and you're going to all of a sudden become brilliant, <laughs> you're not. You're going to have a hard road to go. And you're never going to pay that debt off because this economy's gone and this country's gone, the job market is gone. And in short, we are under the judgment of God Almighty because we have been spitting in the face of the author of human freedom for over 50 years. And I'll show you that in a minute with a little timeline of the post-World War II time period. So you have a lot on your plate. You have a lot to think about. On a positive note, I will tell you, enjoy your high school years. These are some of the best days of your life right here. I'm not telling you not to enjoy them. Enjoy them. I'm not telling you that you can't be a football star, or you can't have girlfriends and boyfriends, or you can't have get-togethers and go to concerts. I'm not telling you that. Enjoy these days and cherish these days because you're making some lifelong friendships right here. And that's one of the beautiful things and the blessings about going to high school and being in a, an environment where most of your needs are met and things are taken care of. So enjoy this time, but understand this. You're going out into a world that has gone mad. Just a quick summary of what we're facing. Not only is America disintegrating, but China is becoming the world's leading superpower. Because our brilliant congressman uh, decided in the 90s to begin exporting the jobs and factories of the middle class. And corporate greed got in there to a point, and no question about it. But the politicians were bought and sold, and both parties did that to us through the damnable trade agreements of NAFTA first, and then in the late 90s it was GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And that went on to create the WTO, the World Trade Organization, a three-judge tribunal in Geneva, Switzerland, that decides all cases in law that have to do with companies and trade and copyrights and patents and things. And we've sold ourselves down the river through stupidity and ignorance of our political system. And so politics is an essential part of American life. And our politics in this country determines, in large part, the fate of the rest of the human race. Now, I didn't like history when I was in high school. I skated by probably cheated on tests, you know, wrote cheat sheets. How am I going to remember that stuff? I don't even care about it. You know, pass the test. Listen, I was a creep and an idiot. I raced motorcycles, chased girls, drank enough to float a battleship when grades came out of junior college. I stole stuff when I was a kid from Sears, Roebuck, and Woolworths, and we had contests to see who had the most fishing lures when we got back from stealing stuff at Sears, Roebuck. I was a jerk when I was a kid. When I was your age, I was a reprehensible little brat. And so I tell you that to tell you, I didn't come from a brainwashing in a Christian home that made me a little goody-two-shoes conservative that I turned out to be. No, not at all. I came from quite the other side of the political spectrum and the spiritual spectrum and the government spectrum I didn't even care about. So well, how did that change? I'll tell you where it changed. It changed right here. It changed with this. Some of you recognize this little Gideon New Testament, the Gideons, fantastic organization, and at that time, I don't know if they're still doing it, but the United States Navy gave me that 
in March of 1976, when I took the oath to join the U.S. Navy and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, so help me God. And they give you a little green New Testament. Why is that? Why is that? Doesn't sound like uh, it goes along with the separation of church and state, does it? You're right, it doesn't. And the separation of church and state is possibly, probably, the most damning, destructive philosophy to the nation out of anything else we could name this morning. This modern concept of the separation of church and state is a Marxist tenet. It is a lie from hell. And those of you that care, I have Thomas Jefferson's original letter that started the whole ruckus this morning as he wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association in Connecticut in, in 1802 assuring them that Congress would make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus erecting a law of separation between church and state. How many of you know what a check valve is? Anybody a plumber's son or something? You know what a check valve is? Or what does a check valve do? check valve only allows fluidity uh, in one direction for a system. That's right. And Jefferson's original statement there was to keep the government from mandating things upon the church. And that's all it was for. What did it mean in essence? It meant that America was not going to be by law a Baptist country, Catholic country, Methodist country, Seventh-day Adventist country, Quaker country, whatever. That's all it meant. But the modern connotation of the separation of church and state is literally to separate God from government. And when you do that, you are doomed, you are damned, and you will be destroyed. Why? Because freedom is predicated upon righteousness. All right, I see a couple of you have my outline here this morning. Has everybody got a chance to look at it or, or got a copy of it or you can find it on where, where do they find it? It's on the mobile site. Okay, I'll never be able to cover that whole 10 points this morning, okay? Seven of them I've used for years. I addended it in, I think, 2009, a couple years ago. Put points eight, nine, and 10 on there. Please read the entire thing there. It's five pages. Before you write your reviews, okay? Because I want you to get the whole ball of wax. And if you want to shred me and tear me in pieces, help yourself. But at least be honest about it and read my whole plank platform position before you write your reviews. But one of my points is that freedom is predicated upon righteousness. And that's the bottom line. That's the truth. That's God's truth. That's proven historically true. And since the founders knew that and the colonists knew that and the Protestant reformers knew that and America's a product of Protestant Reformation thinking, and our first founding document is actually the Mayflower Compact that begins in the name of God, amen. See, since all that's true, that is the reason America became the leader among nations. After, after thousands of years, this is 4,000, 3, 2,000 B.C., thousands of years of world history and nations having that much of a head start on us, not to mention the New Testament time period. Uh, England, 900 years. Russia, 1,000 years. I mean, other nations still forming this great head start. And how does it happen? Have you ever asked yourself, how does it happen that 13 squabbling colonies come along, not even able to agree among themselves on everything, and they fight off in military conflict? The greatest military power on the face of the earth that time was Great Britain. Britain had several nicknames, Mistress of the Sea. I mean, she's the number one sea power. She's the number one military power. Uh, Britannia rules the waves. And sea traffic and trade and commerce built the wealth of nations, and they had the best. They had the best trained army, if you will, the trained marching soldier force. Best in the world. Best equipment. Rifling in the barrels. We didn't even have rifling. Plenty of gunpowder factories, arms factories, uniforms, bayonets, the whole thing, cannons. We didn't have one piece of artillery when the Revolutionary War started. Not one cannon. We did not have a navy. They had the greatest navy on earth. How in the world did these little 13 colonies fight off the great war machine and the all-conquering power of Great Britain? It's because God was doing a miracle in human history. And down here, all the way down here from 4,000 B.C., all the way down here in 1776, they band together and decide that it's high time. Somebody got government right. All right, now what was the form of government 
in England at the time of the American Revolution? Starts with an M. Monarchy. Right. Okay, and who's at the head of the monarchy? King. That's right. Okay, why did we want to do away with the king? Unfair power? Sir, sir? Okay, that's good. Okay. Concentration of power? <coughs> okay. Too much, yes? Freedom to practice religion. Huge reason. Okay, and since you brought that up, what was it about the monarchical system that the Pilgrims and Puritans rejected in relation to the king? Didn't allow Protestant um, sex to practice. Okay, for many, for many years and many centuries, that was true of all of Europe, because Europe was Roman Catholic for the large part. Okay. But even under Henry VIII, who is credited with being the one who started Protestantism, and he was a devil, let's face it. The foundation of Protestantism is pretty rotten because he got mad at the Pope over not allowing his divorce from one wife so he could marry another one. You know, and that's the foundation of rotten Protestantism. And it's dead today. Protestantism is dead. Catholicism is irrelevant because it's not based on the Word of God. It's based on a combination of Old Testament Baal worship and paganism and the Bible and church tradition and the dictates of the Popes and the Cardinals, which are not even scriptural offices. But both of you are correct. It's the concentration of power. So, that, that makes the excellent point. You two guys, okay? Tyranny of government and tyranny of religion, and you're absolutely right. And so, somebody finally says, Europe is hopeless. And it was. Because even under Protestant kings and queens, like Queen Elizabeth, one of the greatest things that Queen Elizabeth accomplished was to make null and void any future Catholic rule in England, and they were going to be a Protestant country. But the problem with Queen Elizabeth and even with King James I was they saw themselves as head of the church. Does any of you understand who the head of the church is? Do you know what it says in the first couple chapters of Colossians there? It says, and he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, that in all things he might have the preeminence and a stinking cardinal thinks he's supposed to be addressed by the title, Your Eminence. He's a blasphemous maggot from hell. There's no such thing as a cardinal. Christ is to have the preeminence. And what I'm driving at is the pilgrims who were separatists. They weren't even Protestants. The pilgrims are better than Protestants. They were total separatists. From Romanism and Protestantism. And they saw clearly that things needed to be started fresh. It started from scratch. And so... What happened is, in 1620, in 1620, they come here. But prior to the 1600s was the 1500s. All right, does anybody remember what, what's going on in the 1500s? What's the major theme of that period in history? It's the Reformation, okay? It's the Protestant Reformation because the atrocities and tortures and murders and treachery of Romanism during the Middle Ages reached such an intolerable height of atrocity that even some of the great men in the Catholic Church said, enough, this is not right, this is not the faith once delivered unto the saints, this is not the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it's supposed to be administered, and great men like that were Martin Luther was one of them. And he's a Catholic monk, but he's the burning fire and driving force of the Protestant Reformation, and he comes out. And in 1517, he nails 95 indictments against the Pope and the Cardinals and the Archbishops and the Bishops. He nails it to his church in Wittenberg, Wittenberg, Germany in 1517. He teams up with a man named William Tyndale. And in 1525, William Tyndale's New Testament in English comes out, which is the first time the Word of God had been actually translated from Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. You need to remember that. Major milestone in human progress and understanding and breaking the shackles of tyranny and government and tyranny and religion. Now the pilgrims come here and they land off course. That's why they wrote the Mayflower Compact. They had a charter. And I'm talking to you about the left and the right. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. We are talking about the left and the right. The left is from hell. The right, right is the root word for righteousness. We're going to the left and right a little bit. But we're going there. So I can demonstrate to you that leftism is the damnation of the human race. The people on the right are the Protestant reformers, the pilgrims, the separatists, the Puritans, the Congregationalists of New England, all the stripes of religious denomination in New England 
that are breaking free from the tyranny of kings and queens and princes and dukes and lords and popes and cardinals and archbishops and bishops and they wash their hands of the whole stinking mess in Europe because Europe was unfit for the gospel. Therefore, Europe was unfit for life as God designed. So the pilgrims come here, they land off course, they land near Cape Cod, Massachusetts, they don't have a charter to land there. They had a charter for the northern parts of Virginia. So being honest and filled with integrity and desiring to do that which is right, they knew their charter was not good for where they were going to land. They draft their own governing document and ask everyone on the ship to sign it. Not everyone on the ship was a separatist pilgrim by any stretch. But they were the driving force for the voyage, and others came for other reasons, but they were the heart of the matter. And so the Mayflower Compact begins, do you guys even look at it? Does it even get studied? Is it even mentioned in an American history textbook in high school these days? I don't know if it is. Well, I encourage you to look it up. And by the way, uh, all of this stuff, go to uh, wallbuilders.com. If you want a crash course in the Christian history of the U.S., if you want to be able to download copies of our founding documents, just about all of them, David Barton's got all of them, wallbuilders.com. The Mayflower Compact, the very first sentence of America's very first founding document that's going to establish a covenant relationship between man and God, not only for our daily bread, give us this day our daily bread, not only for that, but, but for our blessing, our protection, our education, our families, our morality, our lives, everything. And that document begins with the words, in the name of God, amen. And about a paragraph later it says, Having undertaken, here's the reason for the voyage of the pilgrims, of the Mayflower. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, we the undersigned do covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. Ooh, ooh, that doesn't go along with the separation of church and state, does it? No, it doesn't because it's a communist lie out of hell by a wicked Supreme Court whose justices were appointed by leftist Democrat presidents who can't stand the gospel of Jesus Christ and the regulations and limitations that it puts on human behavior. Oh yeah, but those limitations and regulations are for our own good. It's for our good. The Ten Commandments are for our good. God's laws and ethics and statutes are for the good of all mankind. And so they covenanted themselves. They made a covenant relationship. Covenant means two parties, at least, at least two. Well, it was between themselves and before God, because it was in his name. So they established the principle in America of a covenant relationship with God, even in our governing document. Civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation. We want to set up an orderly society. We want to be preserved. We want it to last. Our better ordering and preservation. And furtherance of the ends aforesaid. The ends. What are the ends aforesaid? Aforesaid means just mentioned. So what are the ends aforesaid? The advancement. The glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Those are the aforesaid ends. So your first governing document in this country is in the name of God. Amen. You understand that when we began... After the Second World War, do you understand that we threw God out of the public schools right here, about 63, for the first time in our history? By 73, we had declared war on the unborn child. The 50s are characterized by materialism because we, we came home from the Second World War, and we forgot who we were, and we forgot what we were about. And everybody decided their children were going to have more than they had. And the Depression years were the years leading up to the war. And so we lost our sense of national identity and what life was really all about. We lost the vision that it was all about God and his glory. And we became materialistic in the 50s. The 60s were characterized by rebellion. That's when the British rock invasion came here with the Beatles singing back in the USSR and all of that stinking communistic garbage and drug infested rebellion and LSDs loosing the sky with diamonds and yellow submarines about a little pill uh, speed and Mick Jagger singing Mother's Little Helpers about speed and this whole damnable music transition takes place in the 60s and it's characterized by if it feels good, do it, do your own thing. God's laws don't apply. I'm, a, I'm living for me. 
And by the way, life for the glory of God or life for the indulgence of yourself, that's your great choice. That's everybody's great choice. What's it all about? 70s, sexual revolution takes place. John Travolta, disco fever and all that stinking. Another transition in music. Goes from rebellious music to, to sex-oriented music. And so the 70s, the sexual revolution begins and the family starts falling apart. The 80s, the homosexual revolution begins. You're going to cover that with other speakers in other sessions, and I won't even go into that this morning. But I'll tell you what, they're going to answer. I'll tell you who's going to answer worse than the lesbian or the homosexual themselves. They're going to answer severely enough to God for their reprobate behavior in choosing that which is evil. But I'll tell you who's going to answer are the damnable doctors that perform sex change operations and actually biologically change the gender of a human being that was created in the image of God. Lord God Almighty, hell's not hot enough for those doctors, I'm just going to tell you. I don't care who likes that and who doesn't. I hope this thing goes worldwide. Maybe the reprobate doctors doing that will just have a stroke and check out and quit destroying people made in the image of God. Lord God Almighty. You see where we've gone in this 50-year this time period after World War II? So the homosexual revolution gets strong in the 80s, and the, and the divorce rate hits 50%, and then something happens, and uh, people just quit getting married. They just kind of give up on God's institution of marriage, kind of give up on the idea that in the beginning God created them male and female. They just give up on it all. And so the 90s are dominated by political correctness, where you're not allowed to hurt anybody's feelings. They can claim emotional damage and take you to court and sue you just by saying, no, he crushed me, he made me feel horrible, he injured my self-esteem and all of that stinking PC nonsensical godless garbage. And by 2000, we just lost about all common sense. We've lost our understanding of who we are. National security goes out the window. I mean, we're just, we're just disintegrating during this 50-year time period post-World War II. And Abraham Lincoln captured it. He, he really captured it well. And this is, you know, 150 years ago. Lincoln said it like this. And he said this when he was going to call for a national day of prayer. So it's his proclamation. And Lincoln said this, We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace, multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. And then he says the following, intoxicated by unbroken success. We have become too proud to pray to the God that made us, too self-sufficient to feel the need of redeeming and preserving grace. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power and beg for national clemency and forgiveness upon the nation. <coughs> well, he hit it right. He hit it exactly right. They say history repeats itself. Well, we're repeating again. And again, we have become a materialistic, sexually confused, rebellious, clueless pack of idiots in this country. And at least half the population, even after, even after 9-11, took a chance on somebody named Barack Hussein Obama, born to a Muslim father with a terribly shattered upbringing, with 158 days in the U.S. Senate as his total experience, who voted present almost as many times as he voted yay or nay. We knew nothing about him, about his past, about his communist friends and alliances, his Jeremiah Wright stinking anti-American, godless, pathetic, puke preacher Jeremiah Wright. He is an enemy of the United States. He was Obama's pastor for 20 years. But the God-hating left-wing media that loves the left and hates the right covered up all of this garbage. And so in subsequent years, now we find out that Obama's campaign for Senate was actually begun in the living room of Bill Ayers, who I understand is coming to talk to you, who is a 60s communist revolutionary that ought to be in prison but got off on a technicality because the prosecutors messed up something in the case. 
And you can tell him I, get, I, I said so, and I don't care what he thinks about it. Barack Obama, his past is filled with socialists and communists. And that's why America's policy coming down from the executive branch reflects grotesque un-Americanism, grotesque anti-capitalism, higher taxes, more debt, more spending. And I'll tell you, last year, uh, Barack Obama's college roommate, I've got it up here somewhere, Barack Obama's college roommate, I'll dig this up for you after class, went online and let everybody understand, here it is, that the president is not stupid. This guy says rather he's brilliant. And what Obama is doing to America is not by accident. It's a long-term plan that he has perfected. But he learned the roots of the plan in one of our own universities called Columbia in the United States where he went to college. And two professors there that are far left socialist professors named Cloward and Piven taught how to destroy a capitalist nation by overwhelming the public treasury with benefits and entitlements and stimulus programs and bailouts, and he goes down the list. Universal health care, by the way, if you think that's a good idea, who's the originator of government-funded universal health care? Does anybody know who, whose original dream was that? Who said government health care is the keystone of socialism? Who said that? Karl Marx. It's Marxism. So government health care, cap and trade, Puerto Rican statehood, Legalizing 12 million, it's probably closer to 20 million illegal immigrants. Failure to deal with the borders. Stimulus, bailouts, taxing and regulating small and large business out of existence, et cetera, et cetera. And this man here, Wayne Allen Root, was Obama's college roommate, and he said, Obama's not stupid. He's orchestrating a plan intentionally to destroy capitalism and destroy this country. You need to understand something. Obama's father hated England and America. You need to understand Obama was born to a Muslim father and in Islam, doesn't matter what the mother is, doesn't matter if she's white, doesn't matter if she's French Protestant from Louisiana, wherever she's from, it's the father that dominates the child's upbringing. Obama spent time in a madrasa. Does anybody know what a madrasa is? What's a madrasa? It's a school. It's an Islamic school where the Quran is the only textbook. This is our stinking president. This is our traitor in chief. But this idiot population put him in there. So who's he going to pick for cabinet people? Well, he's going to pick communists and socialists and overthrowers of the capitalist system. And that's what he's done. How many of you know what the national debt is right now? What's the figure of the national debt this morning? Yep, 15, 15, 5. Well, we are in the process of going to borrow now another 1.2 trillion. It's going to be 16.3, 16.4 trillion. The national debt is now bigger than the gross national product. They call it the gross domestic product now. It's bigger than the whole income of the country. Can't fix it. And yet, his solution is spend more, borrow more, borrow more. The Bible says the borrower is serving to the lender. Who's the lender right now? Who are we borrowing money from? Well, oh, you're right. And other foreign governments buying into U.S. debt. We're becoming the servant of others, and he loves it. How much time do I have? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Better get to the main thought this morning. You don't know anything about Obama, and we're all still learning about him. But he is a far-left, Christ-rejecting socialist. He's sympathetic to Islam. He wrote two books. One of them is called The Audacity of Hope. The other one's called Dreams of My Father. And in one of those books, this president actually said, and these supposedly he wrote them during the campaign, in one of those books, Obama literally says, and I quote, I will side with the Muslims if the political winds begin to blow in an evil direction. That's our stinking, treasonous, traitorous president. How in God's name can he swear to uphold, support, and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, 
when he is the greatest domestic enemy on the planet right now. He is the enemy. He's the enemy of your future. And he's going to get us all killed if it's not stopped. So if you want to hug trees and love immorality and hate capitalism and go with Obama and hope and change and all that crap, well, help yourself, but you just committed national suicide by proxy for everybody in the room. I'm begging you to reconsider if you're planning on going that way. All right, a little bit about the history of the left and the right. The left is atheistic from the word go. The right is theistic. The A in atheistic is a negative. It means no fails, no God. Theology is the study of God. Atheist means negative on theology. Theist, theos, theos is God. In 1776, it was not just our Declaration of Independence. I'm going to give you the history of leftism. And I'll tell you quickly, uh, leftism goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, really, because when Satan said, ye shall be as gods, that's what these people think they are. This, this group here, the Charter of the Illuminati, the Bar Bavarian Illuminati, Bavaria was old Germany. They sought to abolish, I didn't put the word abolish in here, but this is all they sought to do away with in a six-plank platform. Abolition of private property. That's totally against the American dream. Abolition of inheritance rights. What does that mean? That means the government ends up owning everything you work for all your life. Abolition of all sex laws and moral codes. Well, the left is pro-death. They're pro-sodomite. They're pro-lesbian. The GBLT caucus is in their camp. This is leftism. Abolition of patriotism to national states. And you know, these politicians are always saying to one another, the, the, the Democrats always say, are you challenging my patriotism? Yes, I am, because you're from hell, you leftist pinko. You're from hell, you Democrat National Platform Committee members. Read Pelosi, dear God, man, the treason of it all. Yes, I'm challenging their patriotism. By the way, by the way, patriotism is not to the president. Patriotism is not even to a party. Patriotism is to the Constitution. Tuck that away on your hard drive. Not even to the parties to the Constitution. Abolition of all ordered government. Oh, except for theirs, of course. What does that mean? That means one world government. No states, no nations, no patriotism. No national identity, just them. This is a one world government without God. Plank number six, abolition. Destroy, do away with. Religion based on faith in God. This is the history of leftism. 1848, Marx and Engels took these six planks and revised and expanded them into the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. If you want to see those ten planks, they're right here. I got them. I'm sure you can look them up if you want to. And it is all about the centralization of power. Everything in the hands of an all-powerful federal government. All right, what is the counter to this Christ-rejecting, God-hating, atheistic, stinking nightmare <coughs> that brought to the human race mediocrity first through socialism because there's no incentive to do better or pr pr produce a better product or strive for excellence and make a better wage and better yourself. It's mediocrity is what socialism brings. There's no incentive to do, to do things in an excellent way. War, death, destruction. Human misery and suffering, a world government without God. Eventually, leftism is going to lead us to the end time, bloodthirsty nightmare regime of a one world government under Antichrist. That's how serious leftism is. Who are the heroes of leftism? Marx, Engels, Trotsky, Stalin, the mass murderer, Pol Pot, mass murderer of Cambodia, Mao Zedong, mass murderer of communist China. Those are the heroes of the damnable left. And Americans are so stupid, they don't even understand. And they go to the ballot box. Well, I'm going to vote for the Democrats. going to give me free health care. You idiot, you idiot. You're voting yourself into communist concentration camp America. God help us. That's a little bit about the history of leftism. What is the counter? God offered this. Listen, this was May 1st of 1776, this charter. God answered this nightmarish satanic plan for world government without God through the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776. Satan's plan, 
God's answer. Left, right, atheistic, theist. No God, it's all about God. This is the left and the right. And the future of this country is in some degree in your hands as Ohio being a swing state. It's partially in your hands. I hope you're taking it seriously. What was God's answer? Declaration of Penance. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, that's us in Great Britain, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station that the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. That's the first paragraph of your declaration. Key statement. The laws of nature and of nature's God. This side says there is no God, and in fact, they want to abolish religion based on faith in God, and they see themselves as the gods of the human race. This side says we're going to govern ourselves, we're going to build a nation, we're going to get it right for the first time in thousands of years of human history, we're going to get it right. And by the way, the Constitution flows from the Declaration, which is the character statement of the nation. And then in 1787 to 1789, the Constitution is the methodology. It's the nuts and bolts. It's the mechanism by which we're going to implement the character statement of the Declaration of Independence. So it begins with the, the key phrase in that first paragraph is the laws of nature and of nature's God. Second paragraph, how's it begin? Anybody know? Second paragraph. We hold what? We hold these what? To be what? What does self-evident mean? Obvious. Right. Obvious, that was it. Okay. Obvious to the most casual observer. So we hold certain things to be self-evident. What are they? Number one, that all men are created equal. You notice they said created and not evolved? What does that mean? This side of the equation on the right presupposes a creator. All men are created equal. They are endowed, number two, they are endowed by their creator. What's an endowment? Right? Who said that? That's two in a row. A for the day, right there. All right. I know I'm mad as fire about the bottom, but I can have a good time too, believe me. Okay? I love you guys. Right? Endowed by their creator means God gives what? With certain unalienable rights. What's unalienable mean? That means they can't be taken away because they come from God. He's the author of them. And so mankind, all of us, are entitled to them under God's design. If we disobey, we're going to lose it. But under God's design, we're entitled to certain <coughs> unalienable rights. And in the middle of the word unalienable is the word lien, L-I-E-N, like a, like a lien against your house because you still have a mortgage on it, okay? It's not really yours. But these are unalienable. They come from God. No government, no king, no tyrant has a right to take them away in God's design. Certain unalienable rights. And then the little phrase, among these, that means not limited to. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right, let's look at that. Life. God breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The Apostle Paul said, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall every man have praise of Paul said, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Why? Because he's the author and giver of life. Jesus Christ is actually the creator. I won't go there with you this morning, but all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ was allowed by God the Father to actually be the creative element of the Trinity. What power? What power? You got five minutes to go. All right, life. Is that including questions and everything? I mean, that's done? We're done. I'm five dead. Minutes. I'm dead. I'm going to shut up and let you ask questions, okay? God breathed in the man who breathed the life. We're entitled to liberty. That word of God says in 2 Corinthians 3.17, what's the spirit of the American Revolution? Well, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Guess what the opposite of that is? Where the spirit of the Lord is not, there is tyranny. And that's where we're going, because we'll become a godless, backslidden, reprehensible, sexually confused, rebellious, wicked, materialistic people. And if we don't repent and experience revival in this country, and if God's preachers don't get with the program of preaching repentance, we're done. We're done. Life, liberty. God's the author of liberty. Christ said, I am come that you might have life, and life more abundant. What makes life worth living? 
The Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Spirit of the Lord is there at liberty. And then look at it. And the pursuit of happiness. What's pursuit mean? What, what is a pursuit? It's a chase. Huh? A chase. Chase, yeah. Go after it, man. The pursuit of happiness is not a stinking welfare check that somebody else worked for. The pursuit of happiness involves the work ethic. Where does that come? That comes from God, too. If any man worketh not, neither should he eat. And of course... We're supposed to care for the hungry and the naked and the downtrodden and the oppressed and the sick and the lame and the diseased. Of course we're supposed to do that. And the churches are the ones that are supposed to do that. And we've allowed government to even take that over. Because this dependent class has gotten so large now under damnable God-hating leftism that the churches can't handle it anymore and the whole society is breaking down. It's breaking down. And the employment rate's 20 the unemployment rate's 20%, not, not 8.234. Then the purpose of government says to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. On this side of the equation, the power comes from these stinking satanic leaders, and you don't have any rights unless they say you do. But under the theistic system of our declaration, and under God's design, power is by the consent of the governed, and that's why we have elections. These people didn't have any choice. I hope you're getting it. And even... When any government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government. Unbelievable, the right to alter or abolish. What does this side lead to? What does the right side of the equation lead to? It leads to life with a purpose. It leads to human happiness, or it used to until we started sliding towards the left and losing our spiritual and governmental mind and our historical understanding is perishing. But it led to these things. Progress! We've done more for the human race than any other country ever has or ever will in the history of the world. Security! Never been attacked on the lower 48, with the brief exception of a little bit of a, a Japanese attack on Atu and Kiska, the islands up there. But we've been blessed in this homeland, never to have been destroyed like the nations of Europe under Hitler's Blitzkrieg or some other thing like that. A blessing to the human race. We pour out more foreign aid and disaster relief and go in to help people and even fight their wars that they can't fight for themselves. We do it all. You know why? Because that Bible <coughs> says, Greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. And we have spent it and spilled our blood and laid it down because this was a Christian nation at one time. And we're perilously close to dying. Life worth living, resistance to tyranny, a little slice of heaven on earth under God's design. That's a contrast of the left and the right. All right, I don't know, I've got a minute, question, anybody, anything. I'll stay around seven periods, somebody will we'll come back. Talk about anything, couldn't cover much this morning. Anybody want to ask you? Go ahead, man. Um, so say um, Barack Obama doesn't get elected this next election, do you still think we're too late? I still think we're finished if we don't repent. If we don't have revival, if we don't return to common sense and limited government, and slash that stinking federal budget. I mean, there is a lot of stuff needs to be done. And as far as, you know, don't even ask me who, who I'm voting for for president on the right side. Of course I'm going to vote for the right. I would vote for Donald Duck, Daffy Duck, and the stinking roadrunner over Obama, okay? It doesn't matter this time. I'm in the ABO party, baby, anybody but Obama. Because he appoints people to the cabinet-level positions that all hate capitalism and hate our country. And by the way, they're all in love with Mother Earth instead of Father God, and they're all mentally ill, okay? Yeah, I, I, that's kind of the answer. You know, yeah, we're still in real trouble. We're still in trouble. And that whole bunch of politicians in Washington needs to fall on their face before God and figure out who God is and who man is and who this country is in relation to the rest of the world. And when this country's done, buddy, Armageddon is right there at the door. God help us love you this morning. Thank you.
Okay, somebody tell me, why did you take polyran? <clears throat> Why'd you sign up? No wrong answer. No problem. Yeah. There are different opinions about things. Things. Yes. Okay. Any special kind of things or just all stuff? Uh, I guess all things. All right, good. Anybody else? Reason? No wrong answers. Some of you just heard it was a blast, right? Some of you just fun? Yeah. yeah, there you go. Easy credit. No problem. Yeah, they can't fail you. You, know, you just go in here, sit here, take the notes, tear up the speakers, tell them they're idiots. I'm just making it. You got it. Huh? You got it. Uh, is that right? <laughs> okay, baby doll. You tear me up, you better know what you're talking about. Put your, hey, put your name on yours. Huh? Oh, <laughs> anyway, look, we, we can have a good time today to a point, but I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to talk to you about some serious stuff today, okay? All right. Your nation is perishing. Your future is ominous to say the least. I'm going to talk to you today about the left and the right. And uh, I've got 10 points on my major outline. Uh, make sure before you write your reviews that you'll go to my outline and read all five pages of that stuff. And agree or disagree, but just, just get the whole picture because it's not just about Obama and the God-hating left. It's about the history of leftism. It's about American political thought, not anybody else's political thought. I don't care what the Europeans do. You know, I don't care what Turkey's doing. This is American political thought, and I'm going to give you where American political thought came from. And I'll give you a little hint. It originates with the Word of God and man knowing who God is and who we are under God's design on planet Earth and what our purpose is. I'll say a few words to start with about life and uh, what makes life worth living and under what circumstances is life most enjoyable and most worth living, and that would be under the circumstances of liberty, under the circumstances of human freedom. We don't even know we're losing it, and your generation is on the brink, and we are losing it piece by piece, decade by decade, and a lot of that has to do with the sin nature in man and our character and government does the only thing it knows how to do when a population breaks the boundaries, pushes the envelope, and decides that they're going to be lawbreakers and idiots and drug dealers and everything else. And the wheels of government kick in, and Congress does what it's supposed to do and passes laws. Only now the body of laws is so voluminous that when you say lawyer these days, you have to ask, well, what specialty, what area you know, of law are we talking about? because we have pushed the envelope and broken the boundaries for so long that we are on the verge of becoming a totally regulated people under the antithesis of liberty under God. <clears throat> now, the Apostle Paul said, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Well, what does he mean there? If we would exercise moral convictions and restraints on our own appetites, our own pursuits, on our own fun things, then the wheels of government wouldn't have to kick in and start crushing the Bill of Rights. But that's what happens when the sin nature in man is manifest, goes uncorrected, unredeemed <coughs> through the gospel of Christ and biblical truth. And we, even as a Christian nation, have pushed the envelope so far now that our civilization is being destroyed. I told the last class, and I'll tell you, don't even think about going to college and strapping on $40,000 worth of student debt unless you are best of the best, cream of the crop, top of the class. Because the job market is just about gone. The average number of people applying for any job out there, whether it's dishwasher at a restaurant or some kind of maintenance tech at an apartment complex, it's about 150 people on average applying for even the most menial jobs. I mean, there are thousands and tens of thousands of educated and college-educated people walking the streets trying to find a place to go to work. And government assistance has almost become God to about half the population. We're on the precipice of collapsing financially. And of the $16 trillion that makes up the national debt now, it's about to be 16.3. Trillion plus of that figure has been created under the first three and a half years of Obama. 
He's breaking us. He is wrecking capitalism. He and his people are obstructing any legislation that could possibly do anything corrective for the economy by way of Harry Reid, Senate Majority Leader, won't let anything come to the floor that the Republicans even propose. Therefore, we're hanging on for dear life as Obama destroys all of our futures. That's not my opinion. The national debt is not my opinion. In 230 some years of this country, okay, the debt is 16 trillion. Over 5 trillion of that happened in the last three or four years. Go figure. Go figure. Obama hates capitalism. He hates America as it was founded. His father hated America and hated Great Britain from which we sprang. His father is Muslim, and if you think that doesn't matter, you're a dreamer. And in one of Obama's books that he wrote during the campaign, this president actually said, I will side with the Muslims if the political winds begin to blow in an evil direction. That is one of the most atrocious statements I've ever heard an American president make. Maybe one of the worst. How many of you understand that Islam is a mental illness? It is a spiritual poison. And it has been at war against human freedom for 1,400 years. And I'm not one of these that goes off the deep end and just says, well, Obama's a secret Muslim. But fact is, fact is, that he was born to a Muslim father. Fact is, he spent time in a madrasa, which is an Islamic school that the only textbook is the Quran. Their loyalty is to Mecca, it's not to the United States. Their obedience is to the Quran, it's not to the US Constitution, and it cannot be if they're a good Muslim. And this pathetic, wicked, anti-Israeli, pro-Palestinian, pro-Islamic president has so much hatred for American capitalism in his heart that his Homeland Security Director, Janet Napolitano, a year ago appointed two devout Muslims to high-ranking positions in the Department of Homeland Security. That stuff's not accidental. He's tearing us to shreds. And do you know that they caught one of those guys a few months ago forwarding the terror watch list from our country to the Middle East? So those guys could not get on planes but get on freighters or smuggle themselves in some other border crossing that we don't watch. Dear God, man. And so my opinion about Obama is he is a disaster. He is an anti-capitalist, anti-American, constitution-shredding piece of anti-Christ human political garbage such as we have never elected in the history of this country. And he is destroying your future. All of us. So the left and the right matters. You say, well, can the, does the president really have the power to do that? Well, he and his cabinet have the power to do that. There's no future for business being started in the country anymore. There's no future for manufacturing because of the EPA and the tree-hugging, new-age, nitwittery that's going on. And if you love animals, so do I. And I had a Rottweiler and lost him two years ago, Thanksgiving, and I had it for 12 years, and it still breaks my heart when I think about it. I'm not against the animal kingdom, but I'll tell you something. You greenies, whoever you are, and I don't even know who you are, but when the greenies become as concerned about the murder of the unborn child as they are about the snail garter fish and the spotted owl and the whales and the mosquitoes and every other thing, then come talk to me about the stinking green movement. I will tell you something. The green movement is the new communism because it is crushing capitalism. It has destroyed the job market. And Obama has tried to ram the green agenda so fast and so strongly upon us that we have squandered another trillion on special grants, millions of dollars to companies like Solyndra. How many of you even know the story of Solyndra? Is anybody watching? Come on, Polly Rad. Solyndra. 500 million taxpayer dollars to this green energy company that just went bankrupt and the whole thing's dissolving. They can't compete. 
part of that's because of union demands, and part of it is Chinese competition. And that was a Oval Office secret stinking deal, 500 million gone because of Obama's, Obama's cronyism and his love of Mother Earth and not understanding, or does he understand, that he is crushing <coughs> capitalist America. But if you want to be a greenie, kiss your future goodbye. You better exercise some common sense. And by the way, CO2 is not a toxin. That's one of those asinine things that has ever been foisted upon the human mind, is that carbon dioxide is a toxin. Dear God, what stupidity. But William James, the father of modern psychiatry, once said in the 1800s that if a lie is repeated strongly enough and often enough, people will eventually begin to believe it. And carbon dioxide and oxygen and the balance is remaining constant down to the third decimal point below zero. I mean, it's ridiculous. But why do they have to do that? Why do they have to say carbon dioxide is a toxin? Because every internal combustion engine, every uh, weed eater, train, plane, ship, except for nuclear power, by the way, he hates that too, but that, that's another subject. But everything that burns what's called fossil fuels, and that's a myth that's also been debunked, and they have made coal in a couple of weeks' time in a laboratory now, and it's not rotten dinosaur bones, and that whole thing is crazy. But for carbon dioxide to be a toxin, and you want to do away with it, I mean, that's what, that's what plants and vegetation and the crops live on. So how stupid is it to declare CO2 a toxin? It is God's miraculous design that we exhale carbon dioxide and grow our food because of it being absorbed by the plants. It's all part of God's design. But they have to declare it a toxin because all the internal combustion processes, whether it's a piston-driven engine or a turbine engine or a jet engine, uh, they've got to do away with that. Al Gore, Earth in the Balance. No, Mr. Gore, you idiot. Earth is not what's in the balance. The human race's future is what's in the balance. But Al Gore declared war on the internal combustion engine. He's an idiot, in my estimation, and I could care less if he sees it or not. Challenge me, Mr. Gore, I could give a rip less. These people are sick. They're mentally ill. And the whole left, the whole left, screams bloody murder over the snail darted fish. And they have promoted the murder of the unborn child as a party forever. Amen. Left versus right matters. It really matters. We're at the edge of being destroyed, and you're at the edge of not having a future. And elections have consequences. The history of leftism is Marx and Engels and Stalin and Goebbels and Hitler and Himmler and Pol Pot and Mao Zedong. Now, what, what do all those people have in common? They are the fomenters of mass genocide and murder, even of their own population to the tune of 60 million plus. We don't even know what the real numbers are. But we know that it is at least 60 million murdered under the various tyrants of the earth. And they are the heroes of the left side of the government spectrum. The forebears of the right side of the spectrum are the New Testament saints, the Protestant reformers, the Pilgrim Separatists, the Great Puritan Migration to America, the Colonial Generation that fought the war to set us free, and the Founding Fathers that crafted a design for the grandest form of government that mankind has ever yet experienced, or ever will experience again, because it's under God's design. All right. <clears throat> America doesn't have a king. At least we're not supposed to. We almost have one now. But we're not supposed to have a king. We have a president. President is not all powerful. He is one leader of one branch, the executive branch. <coughs> so there's judicial, executive, legislative. Anybody care to guess where those came from? How did we arrive at three branches for our federal government? 
We knew we wanted to do away with the king because it's a concentration of power in one man. Like all of those guys on the left side of the equation, kings, emperors, dictators, despots, Mussolini's one of them, others you could name. Concentration of power in one man, that's no good. That's no good. Founders knew it. We're going to divide the powers. That's one of the features of our federal government system that's superior to all others on earth. Separation of powers, checks and balances, limited government, specific delegated rights to the federal government by the states, and power from the consent of the governed. Those are the big things that characterize our form of government. And it is superior. And I'm not ashamed to say it's superior. But I'll tell you the reason that it became superior and became the most liberty securing form of government mankind has yet come up with was because that design of the three branches and the names of the three branches came right from the word of God. And if you care to check me out, it's Isaiah 33, 22. Check it out. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. He will save us. In God we trust anybody. Lord is our judge. Judicial. Lord is our lawgiver. That's what the legislators do. That's what the Congress does. The Constitution says all laws shall originate in the House of Representatives. Okay? The Lord is our king. Executive branch. We don't have a king. The Lord is our king. That's the superiority of the design of our constitutional republic. And it's superior because it's from the word of God. Let me tell you where the founders and the early even church leaders, everyone that was going to go into the legal profession in early America had a library, and in their library were the writings of one of the most brilliant jurists of their time, Sir William Blackstone. And in Blackstone's commentaries on the law, he says this, and I'm giving you this because this is the root of the understanding of their phrase in the Declaration, the laws of nature and of nature's God. Blackstone was a lawyer, jurisprudence expert, theologian, the whole ball of wax, one of those brilliant men in the world at that time and probably even at this time. And his commentaries on the law formed the basis for much of our governing and our development of our principles. So Blackstone says this, his law of nature, God, his law of nature, dictated by God himself, is superior to any other. It is binding over all the globe in all countries and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this, and such of them as are valid derive all of their force and all of their authority immediately or immediately from this original. Upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, depend all human laws. The laws of nature and nature's God. That's the law of revelation. God's revealed law to us in his word. Laws of nature, nature's God, like stuff. Human laws are only declaratory of and act in subordination to divine law. These are some of the keystones of how our form of government became safe, prosperous, secure, blessings poured out, industrial might, military prowess, the whole thing. And capitalism is the engine of that success. Theology is the bedrock of the system. And capitalism provides the incentive the drive for excellence, the extra money to do research and development. It breeds competition instead of mediocrity, as socialism does. And so who ends up saving the world from tyranny in the early 1900s in the conflict called World War I? They're fighting to a stalemate in the meat grinder of the trench warfare over there. And we're still thinking isolationist, but we finally get in and tip the scales in favor of human freedom and spill our blood, toil, and treasure to the tune of 116,000 American soldiers killed 
and freedom survives for a few more decades. World War II, again, we rise to the occasion. And if you don't understand this about World War II, Japan, Italy, Germany, the Axis they're called, listen man, we had to get in. Japanese had already agreed with Hitler to dictate the peace terms to the Americans in Washington after Hitler had assaulted the East Coast and the Japanese had marched across our land to Washington and killed us all and then they were going to agree on how the power was going to be divided up. Oh yeah, we had to get in. Now this time it cost us between 330 and 400,000, not to mention the permanently disfigured and amputated and lives destroyed. So we get in again. Who saves them? Christian capitalist America, twice in the 20th century, saves human freedom for the whole world. Why do we do it? Because greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And we have always answered the call in resistance to tyranny all over this world. Then it was Korea. 53,000 dead. Then it was Vietnam. 58,000 dead. Then it's the Gulf War. And now the enemy is no longer communism, it's communism, it's radical Islam. Only radical Islam is dangerous and all the rest of them. Because radical Islam taps into the spiritual nature that is in man, whether you want to believe it or not. Man's going to worship something. Man is going to seek some kind of Code of ethics, code of truth, code for life. He's going to seek that because it's inborn. And it's inborn because we are body, soul, and spirit. Made in the image of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So man is incurably religious. But the leftists end up worshiping themselves and their own thoughts, their own ideas, their own minds. But the right side of the political spectrum presupposes a creator and based everything on the word of God and the laws of nature and of nature's God. And then they went on to say this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What does self-evident mean? You got it. I know you got it. Self-evident. What does it mean? Um, Evident? You can see something? I mean, it's there in front of you, so it starts with an O. I'm trying to help. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, man. Okay. Self-evident. Doesn't need any outside encouragement. Doesn't need a long explanation, man. It's just self-evident. What were the self-evident truths? So the founders, who presupposed a creator and said they're going to build a society on the laws of nature and nature's God, they're going to get it right because Europe was a train wreck, partly because of popes and, and cardinals and archbishops and bishops, and even under Protestantism, the kings and queens thought they were head of the church. So there's tyranny in religion. And then there's tyranny in government over kings and queens and dukes and lords and barons and duchesses and all of that stuff and there's no private property, there's no free enterprise, there's no capitalism. It's a feudal system in Europe. If your family owned land, you could be a landowner when you grow up. If you didn't, you're never going to own it. If you're a shoemaker, that's it. If you're a farmer, that's it. Nightmare situation. Tyranny in religion, tyranny in government. And the farmer said, we're going to change this mess. You talk about hope and change. There it is, the laws of nature and nature's God. And if we don't return to it, we are done. And by the way, by the way, the change that everybody that voted for Obama stupidly, ignorantly, hopefully voted for him, the change that he brought is from capitalism to communism. It's from the greatest nation on earth to a nation struggling to survive. It's from the world's leading superpower to a nation that vacillates and is cowering in the face of Islamic expansion. A nation that's energy independent to a nation that's financing global terrorism by dumping $700 billion a year into the coffers of Saudi Arabia that are the leading exporter of Sharia law in Islamic truth and madrasas, schools all over the world. We're financing our own destruction under this nightmare of Obama and the God-hating left. We are out of our stinking mind. We're going to repent or we're going to be destroyed. We're going to turn. And we're going to get rid of the stinking Democrats this fall or you don't have a future. Say, well, I just, 
My parents want me to vote that way. You walk in that voting booth and it's you and God Almighty. That's who it is. They can school you. They can educate you. They can desire for you to do that. But it's time for you to start standing on your own two feet because you're going out into a world that has gone crazy. And I'm trying to help you this morning to understand that leftism is the damnation of the human race. And right is the root word of righteousness. Listen, man. It's not an accident. It's not an accident that when you go into the courtroom, it's raise your right hand. It's not an accident that in America we shake hands with our right hand. Where does this stuff come from? It's not an accident that when the first Christian martyr of the New Testament time period was stoned to death, that just before his spirit left him, he looked up into heaven and saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. It's not an accident that God said to the prophet Isaiah thousands of years ago, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, I am thy God. I will sustain thee, I will help thee, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. It's not an accident that when Moses parted the Red Sea, as the children of Israel are fleeing from the tyranny of their day, the Pharaoh in Egypt, and God swallowed them all up, that Moses parted the waters of the Red Sea with the rod in his right hand. It's not an accident that at the judgment of the nations in the Gospels of the New Testament, that the nations are likened unto sheep and unto goats. And Jesus says, my sheep know me and hear my voice and follow me. The sheep are on the right hand. But those on the left hand, he says, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. And it's not an accident that in the book of Ecclesiastes, the supreme book of God's wisdom in the Bible, it says a, a, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's is at his left. And this spiritual truth, I'm sad to tell you. If you were to tell that to your preacher, he'd probably say he'd never heard it before. He thinks whoever said it's crazy. And this is one of the most profound things in the Word of God. And it led to our difference from the rest of the nations. And we knew to do away with a king. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 8, Israel cried for a king. And they said that we may be like all the other nations up until that time. It was the government before then was God through the prophets and the judges and the tribal leaders of the children of Israel. Government was of God, judges, prophets, and leaders of the 12 tribes. Never a king for Israel, God's people. And Israel got backslidden and cried for a king. And the prophet Samuel goes before the Lord and says, Lord, they're asking for a king. And God said, Samuel, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not be king over them. Go tell them they can have a king, but here's what he's going to be like. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you that it was biblical wisdom that caused us to realize we had to do away with the office of the king. And if you'll read 1 Samuel 8, I hope some of you are going to read that tonight. Here's what a king does. He will take of your sons and daughters for uh, butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, pretty much what it says, for servants, maid servants, man servants, for soldiers. He'll take of the firstlings of your flock. He will take the first fruits of your crops. And he will take, 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 because that's what big government does. And that's what a king does. That's what a tyrant does. And, and through the concentration of power, you get life not worth living because there's no freedom, no incentive, no excellence, no progress in your life. And you're locked into being a servant of a, some stinking, wicked, sinful leader your whole existence. And we broke free from that with biblical wisdom. This is the origin of the left and the right. How much time is that? We have about 20 minutes. Okay, I got it. I'm going to run questions. Get, get your questions ready, okay? And, and, and on anything, too. Anything on a 10-point outline or anything not on it? Anything I covered today or stuff that I didn't? You want to know what I think about anything? I'll tell you. Not much time to cover it up. So God's answer to this mess over here, which was in 1776, both of these things happened. The charter of the Bavarian Illuminati sought to abolish, to destroy private property rights, inheritance rights. That means the government ends up owning everything. Sex laws and moral codes, so your morality goes down the drain, family goes down the drain. Patriotism, all ordered government except theirs, and abolish religion based on faith in God. 
This is the atheistic side of the political spectrum. This is socialism. This leads to communism. Because in 1848, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels took the six planks of the Illuminati. And by the way, by the way, the Charter of the Illuminati was written by a former Jesuit priest that defected from Roman Catholicism. Seeing them trying to build world rule through religion, he said, I'm going to do it through the subversion of governments. And I'm going to build a world government by secret societies and underground tactics and undermining the keystones of this thing called freedom that he hated. And so they wanted to abolish all these. Marx and Engels took the six planks, revised and expanded them, turned them into the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. God's answer. This is May 1st, 1776. This is July 4, 1776. God's answer to that mess is the Declaration of Independence, beginning with the laws of nature and of nature's God that came from Blackstone, that came from his wisdom from the word of God. And the lawgiver judge came, again, how are we going to divide it up? From the word of God. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Got off track a while ago on the self-evident. Means obvious the most casual word. All men are what? Created equal. The left doesn't even begin with a creator. The right presupposes a creator. And they say, and that they, the people, are endowed by their creator, and endowment's a gift by their creator, so we're given by the creator what? Certain unalienable rights. Can't be taken away by any earthly ruler, because the earthly rulers are not the grantor of the rights, as these people on the left think they are. These people think that they are the anointed guardians of the human race. These are the people that believe the lie of Satan from the first couple chapters in Genesis where Satan cast doubt on the word of God, said, Yea, hath God said, question mark? Contradicted the word of God when he told Eve, Ye shall not surely die if ye eat of the forbidden fruit. And number three, Satan said, Ye shall be as gods. These people of the left in history, they think they are the gods of the human race. And that's why their plans and their forms of government lead to misery, mediocrity, War, death, destruction, suffering, and eventually an antichrist world government. That's where leftism goes, and that's where it's taking all of us. And Armageddon is at the door right now, friend, in case you don't know. Armageddon is at the door. And Iran threatened to uh, Islamic Iran, Shiite Islamic Iran, and Ahmadinejad is the madman of planet Earth. You better get that straight. So he threatens to uh, close the Strait of Hormuz, where about 40% of the world's oil come out of, knowing that would crush us overnight in our gas prices and further wreck our already destroyed economy. So what does Obama do? Obama calls up Israel and says, hey, uh, we need to cancel those war games we were going to do because uh, you know, Iran's getting peeved off and they're threatening to close the Strait and we can't afford it, so let's just, let's just put that on hold. See, Obama is weakness. He is not strength. He is cowardice. He is not courage. And he loves it as America declines as the world leading superpower. And now we're intimidated by those idiots in Iran, Lord God. We should have taken out their nuclear facilities a year or two ago. We haven't done it. Israel hadn't done it. Now it's almost too late to do it. In Iran, is going to set the world on fire shortly in the Middle East. And then we're going to have $10 gas. Thank you, Obama. I hope everybody enjoys $10 gas. Back to this. Self-evident truths created, endowed by the Creator. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Not limited to. These are some of them. God breathed into man the breath of life. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17. The pursuit of happiness is not a government welfare check. It's going after it. It's blood, sweat, and toil. It's going after it. It's the work ethic from the Word of God. It says, if any man, any man work not, neither should he eat. And power from the consent of the government. The purpose of government under this design is not to abolish those things. The purpose of government on the right side of the political spectrum is to secure these rights. Governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. So the purpose of government under the right 
is to secure the self-evident, God-given, unalienable rights of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and a lot of other stuff listed in the Bill of Rights. This leads to life with purpose, human happiness, progress, security, and being a blessing to the entire human race. Because of the abundance of wealth, and because of our ability to fight other people's wars, and pour out our blood, toil, and treasure, and give disaster relief like no other nation in the history of the world. And we're doing it all. And nobody else on earth is doing it. Nobody else can do it. And capitalism is the engine of that wealth. And this bastardized president hates capitalism. And he is a bastard child of the American political system, I promise you. And some of you are really upset that I would use such a coarse term. Well, guess what? Bastard's not a cuss word, all right? It's a strong word, but it's not profanity. Because that Bible says, if you be without chastisement, then are you bastards and not sons. And Obama is an illegitimate president, put in power and funded by God-hating left-wing socialist, communist, 60s revolutionaries and radicals like Bill Ayers and Saul Alinsky. The whole thing is a communist revolution that we're undergoing right now. And Americans are too stupid to see it because we don't know our left hand from our right. I'm giving you the history of the left and the right. I hope you'll take it to heart. Life worth living. Little slice of heaven on earth. Nothing even close but a little slice of what Jesus talked about when he said, I am come that they might have life and life more abundant. If you'd have said that to somebody during the Middle Ages, they would know what you're talking about. But you and I have finally experienced the best God has to offer anywhere on earth. And there's no place left to go. And this is the getting off place for human freedom. This is it. We go down. It's over with. What's left? What's left on planet Earth by way of blessing humanity when we go down? What's left? Rising communist China? A resurgence of communism? Hugo Chavez? What's left? And there's a Syria-Russian-Iranian alliance that is now working together with China. What's left to preserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? A failed European Union? They're bankrupt and dying. Do you know that like, two weeks ago, nine of the European Union nations received their financial downgrade from Standard & Poor's? They're collapsing and dying and allowing to suck the whole world economy down the drain with them. What's left? Starving North Korea? Communist nut jobs up there? Can't even feed their population and rattling their sabers? What's left on earth? Nothing. Nothing that makes life worth living. Freedom disappears. Islam goes ballistic. World War III begins between Islam and Israel if we fall and Armageddon comes into full view. And this age is wrapped up and it's all over. I'm not trying to put a damper on your future, but this is polyrad. And I'm begging you to wake up and smell the coffee. And some of you, get it in your heart to do something about it. Get it in your heart to research these issues and check me out and the other speakers that speak from a conservative position and see if it's not true. And then decide accordingly with your young life to become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Pull yourself up, tighten those bootstraps, and America ends in I can. Now do it. Do it. Worldview. Okay. Worldview. I understand you've been discussing that a little bit. Atheistic worldview, theistic worldview. What makes life worth living? I'll tell you this. I'm 57 years old, I haven't got much life left, I don't think, according to the doctors. But I'll tell you what makes life worth living. Here it is. God, faith, family, friends, and relationships. And for a lot of us, it's also a lot about country. So you can put that in there. God, faith, family, friends, relationships, and for Americans, it ought to be at least somewhat about country. What's it all about? The wisest man that ever lived was King Solomon of ancient Israel. Solomon, at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, Old Testament, he said, after he had had everything, he had wine, women, songs, singers, soldiers, entertainment, armies, palaces, 
flocks and herds and wealth untold, the riches of Solomon. He had it all. And at the end of his life, and at the end of Ecclesiastes, he boils it all down and says this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter then. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And so back to the original question, what's life all about? Well, it's either life for the glory of God or life for the indulgence of ourselves. And the people who said it was about God gave to this world and to you and me the best life you can experience on planet Earth in the greatest country the world's ever known. All right, I'm going to shut up. Questions, any subject, any topic. Come on, I must have made some out of it. <laughs> Who's the fourth person who you've got uh, under Marx and Nietzsche? Oh, yeah, okay, we didn't get to that. All right. That's uh, Robert J. Ingersoll. Okay, Ingersoll was, uh, and these guys are all 1850 to 1900. I know this is 1848, but the manifesto is printed in 48 and takes root, okay? Uh, Robert J. Ingersoll was a brilliant lawyer and uh, turned his life toward agnosticism and just blasting the Christian faith, okay? And he would say, uh, he would stand on a railroad track, you know, in Europe somewhere, and he'd, he'd swing a pocket watch and he'd look at it and he'd say, uh, if there be a God, let him strike me dead in 60 seconds. You know, he'd say stupid stuff like that. But he took his brilliant legal mind and began attacking Christianity. And so he's kind of like, you know, one of the forefathers of agnosticism. And agnosticism, uh, it's just as bad off as atheism in an eternal perspective, really, because uh, you're done either way. But agnosticism thinks, they think they're playing it safe by saying, well, maybe there's a God, maybe there's a not, but we really just can't know. And can't know is what agnostic means. Ag is a prefix that is negative. Just like the A in atheist and theist is theistic, means believer in God. So atheist means no theism, no God. And so agnostic, okay, the G is in there just for pronunciation. The agnostic says can't know because gnostic, gnosticism, the word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S in the Greek, means to know, okay? So an agnostic says can't know. So that's Ingersoll's position, agnosticism. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, who do you see as a good candidate in the next <laughs> presidential election? Hey, let me tell you ladies something. You ready for this? I know you think I'm a human monster, right? Let me tell you something. You know what I thought would be a really cool ticket? Bachman Palin. <laughs> Scary? Let me tell you what. That little farm girl from Alaska has got more common sense than most of the United States Congress, all right? And Michelle Bachman is a warrior for the Constitution. So anyway, you know, I could go that way. But uh, I would suppose that now, I mean, for me, I'm not really getting behind anybody. Listen, Gingrich is the brains of the operation. He's got some baggage. So what? We're not electing the preacher in chief. We're electing a commander in chief. Gingrich is the brains of the situation, constitutionally, patriotically, militarily, and a lot of other ways. Santorum is probably the strongest Christian of the bunch. Now Romney's a Mormon, and I don't approve of Mormonism, but I have to tell you that Mormonism is pro-family and pro-life and pro-God in their rendition of the Mormon faith. And something else about Mormonism, they love the United States of America and see it as their promised land. So we're not electing the preacher in chief, we're electing somebody to defeat the communism and treachery and treason of Obama so I could actually support Romney. I suppose that uh, Santorum would be my best choice. And as for Ron Paul, Ron Paul would be the best secretary of the treasury that we ever had. We could probably finally get to the bottom of the Federal Reserve, that nightmarish private corporation that manipulates and has wrecked our currency and enslaved us all. But uh, not for president. Ron Paul, not president. Ron Paul's messed up on the Middle East. He doesn't fully understand Islam. He's libertarian. He's not that strong of a Christian. And he would get us killed because of his not full understanding of the menace of militant Islam that is storming the planet again. So I guess I'm between Santorum and Gingrich. That's right. Yeah. Um, in the book of Acts, though, weren't, wasn't the first church communist? 
Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, let me tell you the difference. Okay, I know what you're saying, okay? They parted their goods among each other as every man had need, okay? That's true. And they said that nothing they owned was of their own and all that stuff. Why was that? Book of Acts, you said it. Because it came from God. No, 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 no. Why was it in the book of Acts? What's going on in the book of Acts in relation to the church and the Roman government? Mass persecution. The reason they said that is because they didn't know if they were going to live 24 days or 24 hours. Because on this timeline, I didn't put this in here, that book of Acts is written in the first century A.D. So right here, let's just make this uh, 300 years here. Acts is about here. I think it's 40s to 60s A.D. That time period is when the, new, the newly born Christian faith is under mass persecution from the Roman emperors, the Caesars, okay? And so they are being rounded up, they're being ratted out. I mean, they're saying we have another king named Jesus, you know, and, and Jesus is Lord and Caesar's not God. And they are refusing to put a pinch of incense on the altar to Caesar and say Caesar is God. That's all they had to do to, to, to escape and, and remain alive. But they wouldn't do it because their faith in Christ was stronger than anything that the world had ever seen. So they knew that they were under imminent threat of death every hour of every day. And that's why they said, these goods don't matter. Whatever you need, take it. I might be gone tomorrow. And thousands of them were. It's not Christian communism because there's no such thing is Christian communism. The very definition of communism says that the state is God. The state is supreme. There's no supernatural God. The state is God. And so uh, look up uh, Joseph Stalin, and I've got a little copy of this pamphlet up here on uh, dialectical materialism, but communism totally negates the supernatural. They totally do away with anything metaphysical, anything spiritual. Their view is that religion is a crutch that some people need. They totally disdain it. They are the left. They're the mass murderers of the human race, okay? So there's no such thing as Christian communism. Now, the pilgrims are accused of the same thing, okay? Because of communal farming, which didn't work, by the way. And William Bradford, the second, the second season, said, look, you get this piece of land, you get that piece, you get that, you all get that, you know, we're going to give you all the same piece of land. And every head of house, his family, his children, you're responsible for that plot. And if you're going to eat, you're going to attend that plot, and you're going to grow your own food. The communalism never worked, so you can't say Christian communism. You could say that they entered into communal farming and communal living, but not communism, because the very definition is that the state is God, okay? And by the way, the pilgrims didn't come up with that idea. The pilgrims were under a mandate because of their charter from the, uh, the Merchant Adventurer Society that financed their voyage to a large extent with certain conditions. And one of the conditions was there's a common store and common land and everybody's going to work it so the merchant adventurers could keep track of how much was actually produced so they could take their share of it, see. But by the second season, they know it wasn't working because they're all starving to death. So then they engaged in free enterprise, personal, individual responsibility of families, and then they prospered. We're done? Yeah, Bell's about to ring. Okay. Thank you, Brad, for coming in. It's good to Further questions, if anything wasn't answered, and the whole seven period of here as well. So I appreciate the fact that he's going to take time on the schedule to be with us. Uh, so let's give welcome to Craig Peterson. All right, amen. You won't be clapping time, it's done. Woo! Uh, oh, we can have a good time. Have I seen you before? Yeah. You can come back for some more, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Good to have you. All right. Well, High school's fun, right? I mean, it's a good time, right? You know, it's neat. I mean, tests aren't fun, you know, grades, all that stuff, you know, but you better do what you can to get some kind of education because uh, you're going out into a very, very tough work environment. And if you go to college, don't even think the economy's going to be better four years down the road. You're going to walk into some high-paying job and try to pay off your massive student loan debts. I advise against that for right now, anyway. And, uh, I'll, I'll tell all three classes if you can walk into some kind of a job with a friend, relative, or a family business, do it, do it, do it for at least a year. And let's just watch and see how this thing's going to shake out. America is beyond being at a crossroads. Okay. We. Uh, 
We took the wrong fork at the crossroads in 2008. Drastically, horribly, chronically, maybe terminally, the wrong fork in the road in the elections 2008. Understand that although we do have separation of powers, checks and balances, and limited government, and that the powers are delegated by the states to the federal government, and there are only certain areas that each branch are allowed to set policy in, or to legislate in, that, that's all true. But when you get a president, okay, that hates capitalism, and is pro-Islamic and anti-Israeli, and despises the limitations of power, placed on his office by the Constitution and was born Islamic and has sympathy towards that whole world view, world view, which has been at war against human civilization for 1400 years. You need to understand that the power of the president in that one office is tremendous because his views, his value system is going to be reflected through every appointment, whether it's Supreme Court justices or cabinet level positions, the department heads, you've heard of the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, Department of Education, I mean, these departments. The president handpicks the heads of those departments. And those cabinet level departments carry the force of the federal government and law behind them. So when you get a treacherous anti capitalist, Constitution trampling idiot like Obama as a president, his treason is going to be filtered down through all of those departments. That's why there's no job market. That's why business and industry are leaving this country in droves. And it's not just under Obama. There's been treachery in the past. There's been much by way of sellout congressmen in the past. And I have to tell you that part of the shipwreck that we're experiencing right now happened in the early 90s and late 90s through the NAFTA agreement, North American Free Trade Agreement, and then the GATT agreement, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, went more worldwide. And so congressmen and senators of both parties sold us out for this mythical dream of free trade and more wealth. Well, the wealth isn't coming home to us. And the wealth is now being built in foreign nations, although we have cheap products. So we opted for cheap labor and cheap prices. And we sacrificed our economic future on the altar of the immediate. Now, Obama's the worst, but he's not the only. He's not the only. And uh, Clinton was president when those trade agreements were signed through the 90s there. But both parties did it to us. In reality, both parties, it took both of them to ram those agreements. And buddy, they did it. Because congressmen can be bought and sold if they don't possess character and integrity and true loyalty to that Constitution. And if they don't understand the world situation and things like militant Islam and the resurgence of communist China as a world superpower, and the madman Ahmadinejad of Iran that is on the verge of starting World War III by way of nuclear weapons in the Middle East, and you're going to have $10 gasoline, if not worse. So high school's fun, and there are some things to enjoy here, and do it. I'm not telling you not to do it. Make friendships that are going to last you. Some, some of your high school friendships will last you a lifetime, and that's a good thing. Enjoy this time before you go out there into the college world or the working world. And uh, you go to the working world, you'll be like I was, and you'll find out that uh, the money doesn't go very far on an entry-level job with a low wage, a low starting wage in today's economy. And uh, I hope some of you will find out like I did, that when I did that, I hadn't done it for maybe six months out of junior college, and I said, you know what, uh, life can't be just about Punching the clock, paying the bills, and all the money's gone, 
And my friends from college that I used to hang with all the time, they're going home to their communities, and life's just kind of not got a whole lot of meaning in my present circumstances. And uh, before I got saved, my God was motocross racing, okay? That's what I did, and I just thought, oh, I lived for I got boxes of trophies in my mom and dad's ass. I had to look at them in years, but I lived for the... Uh, what was it, the uh, thrill of victory and the agony of defeat from old CBS Wild World of Sports, they used to say, but uh, it, it was something, it was like an adrenaline rush in motocross racing, but I lived for that and for partying, and I was a drummer in a rock band, you know, and uh, we won the talent contest in high school every year, and I used to play all the drum solo songs on the organ and the drums, and we had two drummers and two organists, and I, I was like superstar rockhead, motocross racing, girl chasing, concert party animal idiot, okay? So I'll just tell you, uh, what I tell you today about the political spectrum of the left and the right and the greatness of America and our Christian foundations did not come from any kind of parental brainwashing upon me because I didn't let any of that stuff take. And I'll tell you quickly, I stopped out of church at about 16 and a half years old and never went back until I was 23 and a half. And so I experienced going into the workplace and stuff not going very far as far as the money and didn't have enough money to go to the races every weekend. And, uh, man, all the college life and friends and all that stuff, a lot of that disappeared, and now it's the grind. It's the workplace. It's paying the bills. And I said to myself, you know, there's got to be more to life than this. It just, it can't be about this hamster in a cage rat race. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. And so uh, after about six months of that, I joined the Navy and uh, went in the nuclear power program, got a fantastic education. But in March of 1976, uh, the U.S. Navy gave me this, and this is a little green Gideon New Testament. And so if you want to know how did I arrive at the place that I am now, spiritually, patriotically, constitutionally, historically, uh, it began right here. It began with this, because for the first time in my life, I saw something that actually made sense. And I began to actually take seriously my earlier life when I was dragged kicking and screaming to go to church every Sunday with my parents. And finally, I got big enough, rough enough, tough enough, and sassy enough that I just told them, I'm done. I'm not going anymore. And I stomped out of church at 16 and a half years old and in front of the preacher and the choir director and the deacons and the elders. I told the whole bunch of them, Christianity is a farce. The Bible is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. You are all hypocrites. I don't want anything to do with this mess. I'm out of here. And I said that at 16 and a half. And through the school of hard knocks and figuring out what life was about and what it wasn't about and what's real and what's not and what is lasting pleasure and what's temporary pleasure through the prayers of some friends that I didn't even know were praying for me, I finally gave in and went to a Bible study as I was stationed on the Charleston Naval Base in about 1977, late 77, getting ready to go out on my first submarine patrol. And I allowed myself to go and I met a bunch of kids that finally, first time in my life, they had a love for each other, they had a love for God, they knew what life was about, they were happy, I wasn't, what is this deal that they're doing? Reading the Bible, playing the guitar, singing the songs of the Lord. And then I saw Hal Lindsey's movie called The Late Great Planet of Earth. Hal Lindsey is a Bible prophecy scholar, he's still writing, still doing some tremendous work. But he made a movie in the 70s there called The Late Great Planet Earth, all about prophecy, the Middle East, the whole situation. And it shook me to my core in Charleston, South Carolina, one afternoon in January. And two weeks later, I gave up my fight against parents, teachers, all authority, and finally said, God, you win. I'm in. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, make me all I can be for your kingdom and your glory from here on out. And so, I'm not a little robotic brainwashed brat that's been taught all this stuff. I had to learn this myself. And you don't even learn it in Bible college. You don't learn much of what we'll say today in most even decent colleges, except for maybe a place like Hillsdale up in Michigan. If you want to go to a place and learn the Constitution and the Christian history of this country, Hillsdale would be the place to go doesn't take any government aid. It'll be tough. You'll have to finance it. But you'll get an education unlike any other college in the country. And that's just food for thought. 
In my senior year of Bible college, God called me to dig into the roots of human freedom and the greatness of America, but yet the demise of America at the same time. I was in college 85 to 90, and things were starting to come apart. Let me show you what's uh, transpired during the uh, time period between uh, the end of the Second World War and now. The 1950s are characterized by materialism. We had the world by the tail. We beat the Axis powers. We came home. The 50s were preceded by the 30s and 40s, the Depression years, and life was tough in America. But we defeated the Axis. We saved human freedom. We came home, but we started forgetting what life was all about and who God was and who we were and what our mission in America really was. And so in the 50s, we began to enjoy all the good things of a free, prosperous, capitalist society. So we digress into materialism being the dominant theme of the 1950s. This causes us to start sliding towards rebellion against truth, against God, against what God says about family, about sexual morality. And this was the generation of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and if it feels good, do it, and anything goes, and make peace, and love, not war. And all of that 60s rebel, stinking Bill Clinton night crap of the 60s went to the White House under Bill Clinton, dear God. And we've just disintegrated since then pretty well. The 70s, the sexual revolution begins when the family starts falling apart, and the, the, the divorce rate goes to the 30 to 35% range. It reaches almost 50% by the end of the 80s, and then it levels off in the 90s because nobody bothers to get married anymore, half of them. Now notice that in the age of rebellion in 63 is when this country's brilliant Supreme Court, with justices leaning left, appointed by leftist presidents, decided to be a good idea to throw God out of public education. So this begins in 63. By 73, we had declared war on the unborn child. 64, we got into Vietnam. 74, we lost our first war. America doesn't lose wars, but we lost that. And there is no more North and South Vietnam. And all that blood, and all those 58,000 American boys that died trying to stop communism over there, just about been in vain because it's total communist North and South. This is symptomatic of a nation in decline. This is decay. 90s, political correctness. Hate speech, hate crimes, hate laws. Bigot, racist, homophobe, right-wing extremist, patriot radical, all of this crap that comes down as a barrage from the left-wing God-hating media against people like me that are trying to point out our slide towards national disintegration trying to make people reassess and love the pilgrims and the Puritans and the Founding Fathers and the beautiful safeguards built into our constitutional system that are being trampled. And then by 2000, we've lost all common sense, and God has about had it up to his holy eye sockets with the United States that he has blessed and prospered more than any nation in the history of the world. And 9-11 occurs. 2001. That is a gigantic chastising slap in the face to the United States to try to shake us and awaken us to this five decades long slide away from the idea that it's all about him and it's not about us. Abraham Lincoln made an observation during the Civil War and the calamities and treacheries that during that time and the death and misery and human suffering on both North and South. And Abraham Lincoln called the nation to a day of fasting and prayer and said to this effect, we have been recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been blessed, prospered, and increased and strengthened like no other nation, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand that has preserved and protected us. And then he goes on to say, intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too proud to pray to the God that made us, too self-sufficient to feel the need for redeeming and preserving grace, and he called the nation to repentance and fasting and prayer before the offended power who is the author of liberty and the God of human freedom. He was about right. 
And during this time period, we repeated that cycle again. And we forgot what it was all about. All right, well, what's life all about? What's it really all about? We have hobbies, we have pursuits, but I just want to share with you, okay? I'm 57 years old, okay? I may not make 58. I've got terminal cancer, okay? Let me tell you what my 57 years have taught me through the school of hard knocks that is really important in life, okay? Can I, can I just say this to you? Life is about God, faith, family, friends, and relationships, okay? That's what it's about, man. I'm not telling you not to enjoy high school. I'm not telling you not to have friends and play sports and do the things that, that bring you some form of fulfillment and happiness, but overall, it's not about us. It's about God. Now, the foundations of our country that were laid so long ago that led to this magnificent degree of freedom that we still enjoy to a point. It's shrinking, it's evaporating, but we still have a higher degree than most any place on earth. We can still pursue the career we want, the job we want, the profession. We can go to the school of our choice. We can travel state to state and don't have to show our papers. I mean, it's unbelievable what we have here, but until you've been somewhere else and lived under tyranny, we don't really appreciate it. So we study history. So we'll understand what blessings we have here. But that's my assessment of what life is really, really all about. And the people that founded this great country, that was their assessment as well. <coughs> and so you'll find that before the Constitution, before the Declaration of Independence, before the colonial charters that are magnificent theological statements. I mean, the colonial charters, you ought, you ought to look those up. Just look up the colony. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, the fundamental orders of Connecticut. Uh, these people, even before our founding documents, to them, it was all about God. And before the colonial charters were the pilgrims. And so our first founding document is really not the Declaration. It's not the Articles of Confederation that were before that, not the Constitution. Constitution is the nuts and bolts. It's the mechanism by which we're going to implement the dream of one nation under God and the character statement that is the Declaration. But long before all of that, all the way back in 1620, in 1620, the pilgrims would come here and they would separate from Roman Catholicism in Europe. But guess what? They also separated from Protestantism in Europe. And that's why if you read anything reputable about the pilgrims, they weren't Protestant, they weren't Catholic, they were god fearing Bible-believing separatists. And the pilgrims were even better than the Puritans. And as wonderful as the Puritans were, and they came ten years later, by the way, because they finally figured out Europe was hopeless as well. But the pilgrims separated from it all, and they came here, and they actually gave us our first founding document. And this is where they laid the cornerstone of this nation, and they're believing it's all about God as well. And so the Mayflower Compact begins. Anybody know anything about it? Somebody tell me one thing about that document, the Mayflower Compact. Anything you can think of. Yeah? It was, it, they signed it because they wanted to make sure that anyone could, that they could just practice whatever they want without having the church from across the ocean force them to do something else. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. That's why they left over there. They're not going to have a king thinking he's head of the church or a queen. And they're sure not going to have a pope as head of the church because that's a man-made office that doesn't even exist in scripture. And I'll just give you three reasons why Peter couldn't be the first one. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou won't be offense unto me. Because Peter still didn't get it that Jesus had to go to the cross. So he takes out his sword and whacks off the high priest's servant's ear. And Jesus picks it up and heals it. Strike one, Peter. Strike two. Uh, Peter, when Jesus was being taken to trial, Peter denied the Lord three times and standing, warming, warming himself by the enemy's fire. And the lady said, I know you. You're one of them. You're one of the disciples. He said, I am not, I am not, I am not. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, no, never, not me. No, Lord, I'll go with you to the death. But when push came to shove and the rubber hit the road, Peter denied the Lord three times. And the other reason Peter wasn't the first pope is the scriptures talk about Peter's mother-in-law. Well, if you got a mother-in-law, then you're married, man. 
and that's a disqualification of being Pope. So the whole thing is a stinking racket. It's a man-made invention. It's an office. The Pilgrims and the Puritans knew it. They separated from both, however. And the ultimate reason there's no such thing as a Pope in Scripture is because Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Colossians 1. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And anybody that has a title on this earth called your eminence is an idiot and a blasphemer is going to answer to God. Okay? So that's why Peter couldn't be the first pope. But you're quite right, the gentleman that said that. A religious freedom is a huge part of their coming to America. But they're also fleeing from tyranny in government. Because the kings and queens, even under Protestantism, they thought they were the head of the church. And they had their archbishops, and their bishops, and their policy, and their Episcopalian Book of Common Prayer Church of England and a regimen, and you're going to do it the king or the queen's way, or you're not going to do it. And so they start locking everybody up that won't just fall in line with the way the king or the queen says to worship God. So that's right. That's correct. But the Mayflower Compact is actually a necessary thing because they landed off course in Cape Cod, Massachusetts area, rather than the northern parts of Virginia, which was where their charter was for. So they realize, okay, our charter's not good for this area. It's late November. We are not going to survive if we don't build some shelters and, you know, start building, building some homesteads. And uh, the ship's going back in the spring, so we've got to do it. And by the way, by the way, the pilgrims are the, are the greatest example of God-fearing, Bible-believing, self-sacrificing, suffering people in the annals of history. Because when the ship captain begged them in the springtime to come back to England with them, after half of them had died that winter, and 42% of their wives had died, and children had died, half of them are dead, and the captain begs them to come back and get on the Mayflower and sail back to safety. And they would not, they would not, because they know Europe is hopeless. And we're going to start from scratch. And all they had was their love for God, their love for each other, their Geneva Bibles, and, you know, that's it, that's it, a few clubs, that's it. So they stick it out, and they start their document by saying, in the name of God, amen. That makes it pretty clear what they're about, now, doesn't it? In the name of God, amen. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, we, the undersigned, do covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation. It's a governing document. For our better ordering and preservation. It's about the future. And furtherance of the ends aforesaid. Aforesaid means just stated. The ends are the goal. So what's the goal that had just been mentioned of the whole enterprise? In the name of God, amen. For the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. These are the purest of the pure. These are more pure than the Puritans who wanted to purify the Church of England. That was about half as rotten as Rome, okay? And so they wanted to purify the Church of England from within, so they stayed behind for another 10 years. They finally realized there's too much power in a king. There's no reasoning with the king. And let me give you this tidbit of history. The reason monarchy is no good for human liberty is because the king has the power to dissolve the parliament. That would be like our president having the power to tell Congress, go home, I don't want you, I don't need you. And by the way, Obama just, uh, just appointed two recess appointments against the Constitution and told the Congress to get lost. He thinks he's a stinking king, and he has got to go. If Obama is not gone, none of us have a future. Our nation is already destroyed economically, we are destroyed job-wise. We've had the, the housing bubble. It has burst. Construction industry is in the garbage can. Manufacturing is destroyed because of radical tree-hugging, new, new age, nitwit, environmental hysteria, and CO2's a toxin. You've got to be kidding. What insanity is that? But all this crap is coming down from Obama because he is a God-hating leftist, anti-capitalist, constitution-shredding, political monster. And he's orchestrating a plan to crush this nation's superpower status. 
And he got that partially from his father that hated America and hated Great Britain and hated all colonial powers and partly from his Islamic upbringing. And he can't possibly be loyal to the Constitution. He is killing us. In 235 years of this country plus, the national debt has gotten to $16 trillion. Five trillion of that amount has been created in his first term. A third of the entire national debt of this country from our family has been created just under him and Reed and Pelosi. Dear God. And there's no end in sight. And I'll tell you something. The American dollar is going to be put on the ash heap of history. And I keep up with this stuff. And a fellow, I, I won't name him because of copyright infringement and all that stuff, but there's a guy that has been studying this stuff for 35 years as a banker, investor, financial strategist. And he said that last year, the Chinese and the Russians and the EU, several other countries, had a secret meeting without us, and they're planning on dumping the dollar as the world's standard reserve currency. Now, when that happens, then oil is no longer going to be keyed to the American dollar. And right now, we're, we're able to stay afloat because we just keep printing money and borrowing money. And everybody has traditionally wanted the dollar because we're the strongest nation on earth with the strongest currency because America is the greatest power. So that's been the case. That's no longer the case. We're done. They know it. They're going to dump the dollar. We're going to have a depression. It's that serious. And Obama is presiding over this dive into depression. And he's loving every minute of it. You couldn't do the stuff he's doing to us by accident. And by the way, his college room, roommate named Wayne Allen Root, and you can find this on the internet if you want to look up Wayne Allen Root. Obama's college roommate said he sat in the same political science classes with Obama at Columbia University. He was Obama's roommate. They had conversations. There are two left-wing, far-left socialist professors at Columbia University that taught Obama how to destroy a capitalist nation by overwhelming the public treasury with benefits, stimulus, entitlement programs, and bailouts. Crush the private sector, and the engine of capitalism is destroyed. And a man that hates this country is who we've got in the White House. And he hates it as founded, and he hates the constitutional limitations of power. And if he has a second term, he'll rule by executive order like a king, and we're done. We're finished. These are just the facts of the matter, and this is what's coming. Well, back to the pilgrims. They got it right. So they laid the idea, they laid the foundation idea of a covenant between themselves and God for their governing, for their daily bread, for their survival, their future, furtherance of the gospel. They laid that foundation in the Mayflower Covenant. That foundation is further reflected in the colonial charters. And I've got a couple of uh, just excerpts. You can look up the colonial charters. The strongest one of these statements is probably Rhode Island. Now, a colonial charter, this is the beginning of one of the colonies and what the colony says it's about. And again, it's either all about us or it's all about God. These are the foundation of freedom. The Rhode Island Charter says, we submit our persons, lives, and estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and unto all those holy and most absolute laws of his given us in his holy word. That's a charter for a colony that becomes a state. Doesn't sound like church and state, does it? No. And the separation of church and state is a misguided, mythological, satanically interpreted lie to destroy the foundations of freedom which are all in the gospel and the word of God. Fundamental orders of Connecticut. Here's one that really tears up the modern notion of separation of church and state. This would have been in the area that's now Connecticut and a couple of uh, counties up there, Weathersfield, Hartsfield, Weathersfield, Hartford, a couple of, couple of uh, three counties got together and founded this. Here's our purpose. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God by the wise disposition of His divine providence, and well knowing where a people are gathered together, the word of God requires there should be a decent and orderly government established according to God. We enter into combination and confederation together. Just like the pilgrim says, we combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. 
Ooh, the word politics in a document that has God in it. You see how ridiculous the separation of church and state is? The new interpretation of separation of church and state is destroying the very foundation stones of human freedom. It's a lie. It's from hell. It's an ACLU, Roger Baldwin, 1920, Marxist communist, card-carrying communist, founded the ACLU to kick the foundation stones of our republic out from under us, and they have done it and done it and done it. And unfortunately, most preachers haven't got the guts to even address this kind of stuff or dig into it. To maintain and preserve... That's just like the pilgrims saying, our furtherance and better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the end. Same thing, same spirit. And preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess. The Charter of Virginia, first charter of Virginia. We, greatly commending and graciously accepting of their desires for the furtherance of so noble a work, which may by the providence of Almighty God hereafter tend to the glory of of his divine majesty and propagating of the Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God. Et cetera. You go on through the colonial chart. This is the foundation of the greatness that would become the United States of America. All right. This foundation has been under attack for a long time. This piece right here is uh, 1850 to 1900. Marx, Marx and Engels, Communist Manifesto, printed it in 1848. People started looking at it, started coming into vogue in Europe. 1859, major milestone, Darwin, evolution of species. Let me tell you something about Darwin. Towards the end of his life, he realized some of the wreckage that he had wrought by his so-called evolution of species book and his theory of evolution. Darwin said the following. When I look at a peacock's tail, it makes my blood run cold. What does he mean? A peacock's tail is that great big, you ever seen one great big, semicircular, beautiful feathered arrangement thing? It's got all these circles. It's got all these gold and blue and purple circles in it on the fan tail of that peacock's tail. But here's the deal. The circles are not just on one feather. And it'll take up to a half a dozen feathers and everything growing to just the right place for those beautiful medallion-like gold circles to form on that peacock's tail. And Darwin was saying in so many words, that scares me to death because it blows my theory to smithereens because the mathematical impossibility of that happening by random selection and chance is out of the universe. That's what he was saying. Darwin also said, when I consider the intricacies of the human eye, it makes me tremble. Oh no, he knew. He knew he was wrong, and he's been proven wrong. And Heckel's embryos and the, the chart of the Homo erectus and Homo epictus and Cro-Magnon man and all of this monkey brain stuff that comes down to a human being is a load of stinking, humanistic, Christ-rejecting scientific garbage. And it's being proven so year after year. 700 of the world's leading scientists just in the last few years have signed on to an international statement that says we now no longer can believe that there was this random chance evolutionary process, the mysteries of the universe, the complexity of the molecule, the atom, the particles, the electron rings, all of these things that hold matter together. They're saying we can't buy it anymore. There's obviously a designer. And let me tell you what God said about the human body. Through the psalmist said, Thou hast possessed my reins, that's the inward parts. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. And the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and that my soul knowest right well. My substance was not hid from thee. He's talking to God. My substance was not hid from thee when I was curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth, and in thy book all my members were written, hands, feet, eyes, hair color, eye color, everything. In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, but when as yet there was none of them. And I'm here to tell you tonight, if you want to go ahead and believe that you came from the eternal cosmic slime and muck, from a one-celled amoeba or a protoplasmic stinking bacteria molecule that 
grew feet and sprouted wings and flew around and landed on a college campus with a PhD teaching people they came from monkeys, you're sick. It's the worst kind of sick, you're spiritually sick. It takes more faith to believe a lot of crap like that than it does to say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God made man in his likeness. And that's why you and I are body, soul, and spirit, because God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Everything's in threes in the creation. All of matter is liquid, solid, or vapor. It's all about God. The pilgrims knew it was all about God. The Puritans knew it was all about God. They were a little late getting on board, but they knew it was about Him and not us. And they laid the foundation to build what became the greatest nation the world's ever seen. A little bit about, yeah, 12 minutes. 12. I got a shut up. I got a shut up. I haven't gotten anywhere. So, where were we? We were with these guys. There's an assault on human thinking, okay? In this time period, it's an assault. All right, Marx, uh, Communist Manifesto, Darwin, Evolution of Species. See, this is when everything that man believes and the church believes about God and man, this is when everything is being questioned and turned upside down. Nietzsche, uh, nihilism, nihilism. It means nothing has any meaning. We're just floating through the cosmos, and there's good, and there's evil things happening. We're out of control. There's no God, and we just... We just suffer and survive through this. There's no permanence. There's no meaning. What a hopeless, nightmarish view of the world that is. And he ended up going insane, by the way. But his major premise was God is dead. So that was Nietzsche. Ingersoll, father of maybe modern agnosticism, we would call him. Brilliant lawyer, decided to attack Christianity and turned his brilliant mind into a machine that questioned everything that God had ever said. Freud, psychiatry, James, psychology. And Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, about 1890, founds the Theosophical Society, which is a combination of philosophy and theology. She's the founder of what's called the New Age Movement and the strong delusion in 2 Thessalonians 2 that's going to lead the world to worship Satan under the form of the Antichrist. And so all of this takes place 1850 to 1900. That's our breakdown after the Second World War. The results have been disastrous. This side of the equation, the left, leads to mediocrity, misery, misery, war, death, destruction, human suffering, and eventually a world government without God that culminates under Antichrist. This side that says there is a creator. He gave us. He endowed us with certain unalienable rights. This side says life is a, is a gift of God. God breathed into man the breath of life and he became a living soul. The side that says liberty is a gift of God because the scripture says where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. And the side that understands that the pursuit of happiness is not a government bailout or a stimulus or a program or a welfare check. This side of the equation built the greatest, freest, strongest, most prosperous nation in the history of the world that has blessed the world without measure and is still trying to do it even though we're collapsing. That's left versus right in a nutshell. Your whole future is in the balance. The future of the human race is in the balance because when America dies, there's nothing left out there but a Russia-Syrian-Chinese alliance and Iran, Ahmadinejad, the madman, Iran going nuclear, starving North Korean communist nation, rattling their sabers, failed European Union, China rising superpower. What's left out there that's going to secure and defend and promote freedom? which is one of the best things that makes life actually work with There's nothing left. We're done. World's done. America falls. Armageddon time. Everybody's going home. To one place or the other, by the way. Choose you this day whom you shall serve. But I decided at 23 and a half years old that I'd line up with Joshua and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Prophet Isaiah said, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. For he is gracious and full of mercy and will abundantly pardon. And it's time for America to return to the God of human liberty and repent and restore common sense, godliness, and truth. All right, I'm going to shut up. You've been a good audience. Questions on anything. Doesn't even have to be something I covered. Anything. Yes, ma'am. So, like, you wouldn't blame the ride for any of the, for causing any of the stuff that's happening on American now? Like, you just blame the left and Obama? 
No, I, I tell you, I tell you what the right did to us, along with the left, in the House and Senate during the 90s. They are partly responsible. Congressmen get bought and sold by lobbyists, okay? And so the trade agreements that began the exit of American manufacturing that is in part responsible for the joblessness down here now, yeah, I, I can discredit the Republicans for that because a lot of them, and even including Rush, was pro-free free trade, and a lot of the guys that, that uh, we considered pretty smart, uh, they went for this free trade business. I mean, they did. And so it's not all their fault, but we've woken up, we realize we're failing, we realize we're jobless. Housing is gone, therefore construction is gone. We're enslaved to Saudi Arabia and the OPEC countries for our oil supply. We're dumping $700 billion a year into the coffers of foreign powers that hate our guts and want to see Islam rule the world and America the great Satan destroyed. So we're waking up. The right is not totally without fault. But, but the, difference, the, di the difference is right here. And I have a whole other chart that I didn't get on the board, but the right is basically, even though some of them are stupid, okay, some of them are in the pits and can be bought, but the right is basically about the work ethic, strong military, strong national security, tight borders, capitalism, okay, and, and even blessing the rest of the world by trying to fight for freedom somewhere else, you know. And the left is no problem with killing the unborn child, totally in love with Mother Earth and the mosquitoes and the spotted owls and the snail darter fish, crushing business and industry through green regulations that make it impossible for us to rescue the economy by employing anybody, and, and, and on and on the list goes. So the left has gone, the political spectrum has shifted both ways, okay? You're right. Hey, look, and I'll tell you what, since you asked that, uh, I'm not a born-again Republican, okay? Not by any stretch, okay? I'm like Hannity. You know, Hannity will say he's not Republican, he's a conservative, okay? Well, that, that's where it is, okay? And uh, I suppose that the choices we've got left, you know, Santorum would be my first, Gingrich would be my, like, 1.5. Uh, I don't care for Romney that much, but the Mormons love America, so I'd much rather have a Mormon that loves America in there than a leftist communist that's destroying capitalism under Obama. See, I'd rather have one of them, but they're not perfect. And none of them are perfect. I'm not, I'm not saying that they are. But the fault of the left is just a total disavowal of the miracle of America. And that we need to continue to be the superpower because we are the guardian of human freedom on the face of the earth. And it's been nothing but weakness and military cutbacks, slashing the Pentagon budget. And it's all about social programs, bailouts, and stimulus, and entitlement programs, which have now brought us to the point where we are $16 trillion in debt. Nothing's going to fix that. And yet Obama keeps wanting to empower that pathetic bunch that supported him, who is composed of the PETA people, the NAMLA people, the GBLT crowd, the unions, the socialists, the communist revolutionaries. I mean, the constituency of leftism is as un-American as anything you can think of. The constituency of the right is basically business owners, small and large, and farmers, people that are tied to the earth, being naturally more inclined to be tied to God because of weather having an effect on agriculture and things. I mean, the right is entrepreneur. The right are people that strive for excellence and want to do better and make a better salary and invent a better product and competition. You know, I mean, there's great differences in the left and the right. So we're being cooked. We're, we're like a frog in the kettle. We're being boiled alive. We're done. And so Obama's got to go because all of his appointments are communist revolutionary sympathizers out of the 1960s. And I understand Bill Ayers is coming. So uh, you listen to him and ask him to try to justify all the treachery that's going on now. He's got a whole different view, you know, of the world. And he ought to be in prison and he got off on a technicality because the prosecutor screwed up when he and Weather Underground Bunch bombed the Pentagon and killed a police officer. I got no patience for idiots like that. And by the way, Obama's campaign for Illinois Senate started in that guy's living room, Bill Ayers, that's coming to talk to you. He's a creep. He's a communist. He's a left-wing revolutionary that's overthrowing the United States. He's coming to talk to us? Yeah, that's what I heard. Somebody said that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fire him up, man. Fire him up when he gets <laughs> drunk. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so you obviously did not like Amadeus Shah. Uh, what do you suggest we do about it? It's not a matter I don't like him. He's insane. Okay. Look, I don't like insane people, so I'm saying. Okay, no. A couple years ago, listen, Ahmadinejad let it out of his mouth. He said to the whole world, he spoke at the UN several times, okay? He said, we will gladly trade Tehran 
for Tel Aviv. What is that? Tehran, Iran? He would trade cities. He would swap cities just to destroy Israel. Okay? Um, I, I don't know if I said this in the beginning of your class, but you know, Islam has been on a war path against human freedom for 1,400 years. It's not just Ahmadinejad. It's not just Bin Laden. It is a worldview. It is a mindset that they have that says the whole world is going to bow to Allah, and if you don't uh, like it, we're going to kill you. Okay? And so creeping Sharia is coming. It's already taking all of Europe by fear. It's in, even in the courts of England. The Archbishop of Canterbury last year said at some point, uh, we will have to incorporate some facets of Sharia law into our courts just to keep the peace. That is insanity because Islam is about world conquest. It's about Allah's way or no way, and we're all dead. So it's Ahmadinejad is a Shiite. They're Shiites and Sunnis. And uh, the insanity of Islam is so bad that, I mean, I mean, they kill each other like they kill us. I mean, there's infidels, which is us in the West and the Christian. But I mean, the Sunnis and Shiites have been fighting for hundreds of years too, and they'll kill each other pretty quick too. So it's a real insane mindset uh, because the Quran is a book out of hell, and the Bible is a book out of heaven, okay? And I feel sorry for Muhammad, but I'll tell you, he had a terrible upbringing. He was shoveled off from relative to relative, uncles, grandparents, you know. He was totally illiterate, couldn't read and write, and had some visions and revelations in a series of cave experiences that we're supposed to believe God delivered this book by which all of are supposed to live. And it's done nothing but make war against human freedom for 1,400 years. So it's very serious, and it's not that I don't like Ahmadinejad. He's the madman of the planet at the present time. And he's going to be the author of World War III if somebody doesn't stop it. And we should have bombed the nuclear facilities and disabled them a year and a half, two years ago. And we're not going to do it under Obama. And now it's almost too late to do it. And if Israel, here's the dilemma. In the tenth point of your outline, I think I put on there Israel's dilemma. What's the last point on the last page? Number ten. What's number ten? Maybe number nine. Uh, eight. Eight. Yeah. Israel's dilemma. Read over number eight on the outline when you get it. If you access it on the website or whatever. Roman numeral eight. Yeah, Roman numeral eight. Middle Which, East conflict. Yeah. Four thousand years old. Yeah, read that over because, not you, but, but uh, it's a no-win situation. The Middle East is fixing to go up in flames, and Islam is the author, and we should have stopped him. We hadn't done it because we're, we're weak. So anyway, God's the author of human liberty. Christ came to set men free. Time to evaluate what, what life's about, young people. Love you. Thank you for coming here.